All right, shall we Delaney? A uh, sure thing. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Delaney Kelly. I work in reference and adult services at the New Haven Free Public Library. And I'm very thrilled to be here tonight for another installment of our Democracy in America lecture series presented in partnership with Yale Public Humanities. Tonight's talk is facilitated by Yale University Professor Matthew Jacobson. And his guest this evening is Dr. Laura Briggs professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. While we are excited to welcome you virtually tonight, we look forward to the day where we can gather in person again. Thank you, Professor Jacobson, Professor Briggs, for this important conversation this evening. If you live in New Haven, I encourage you to get a library card if you haven't already. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a copy of Professor Briggs's book how All Politics Became Reproductive Politics, as well as another recent publication of hers, Taking Children, A History of American Terror. So if you enjoy the discussion tonight, these books are available to be checked out. If you're outside of New Haven, you can even request them through interlibrary loan. We have a great selection of books, both written by Yale professors as well as academics from institutions all over the country, such as Professor Briggs. So feel free to stop by and check them out for yourself. Professor Jacobson, over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see you here tonight, um, even though I can't see you, but I know you're there, which is a good thing. Um, I want to open with a few thank yous. Thanks to our, our partners at the New Haven Free Public Library. This is a really important partnership for us. It's now several years ongoing, and it's been a really wonderful thing. Uh, so thanks to our colleagues there, Delaney Kelly, who you just met, Seth Godfrey, Marion Huggins, Luis Chavez Brumel, Rory Mortarana, and Isaac Shubb, especially those, those folks, um, and, but the, the entire staff as well. And thanks to my colleague, Karen Rothman, who does so much for Public Humanities and has done so much for this series, and our associate, Jake Gagne, who's working even now as we speak on the back end of the webinar. He is, uh, as well, does a lot for the Public Humanities at Yale. Uh, one program note before we start, next Friday, March 4th, we'll have a special Friday noon edition of Tuesday Night at the Library. We'll be welcoming my colleague, Laura Baraclough, uh, who will be talking about National Park Service heritage sites and heritage trails as a democratic and sometimes not so democratic cultural form. I hope you can make it. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Laura Briggs. Briggs took her PhD at Brown University and she taught at the University of Arizona before joining the faculty at UMass Amherst, where she currently teaches in women, gender and sexuality studies. Briggs is an expert on US and international child welfare policy and on transnational and transracial adoption. Her research studies the relationship between reproductive politics, neoliberalism, and the long durée of US empire and imperialism. Briggs has also been at the forefront of rethinking the field and frameworks of transnational feminisms. Briggs' newly published book, Taking Children, uh, which Delaney just showed you, examines the 400-year-old history of the United States' use of taking children from marginalized communities, from the taking of Black and Native children during America's founding to, the, to uh, Donald Trump's policy of family separation for Central American migrants and asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border uh, as a violent tool for political ends. Briggs' new book project, entitled The Future is Born in Small Places, The Gendered Biopolitics of Freedom, debt imperialism and unnatural disaster in the Caribbean focuses on historical and contemporary uses of debt in the United States and the Caribbean as a political tool of disenfranchisement and expropriation. Her other books include Somebody's Children, The Politics of Transnational and Transracial Adoption, winner of the James A. Rowley Prize of the Organization of American Historians, Reproducing Empire, Race, Sex, Science, and U.S. Imperialism in Puerto Rico, and International Adoption, Global Inequalities and the Circulation of Children, co-edited with Diana Marr. Her writing and research have appeared in Adoption and Culture, American Quarterly, Feminist Studies, Radical History Review, and American, Inter in American Indian Quarterly. Briggs is also a public intellectual whose work has been featured in court cases, podcasts, journalism, including on National Public Radio, Slate, PBS, New Republic, 
Indian Country Today and Ms. Magazine. She began her intellectual career as a journalist for Gay Community News. Tonight, we'll be talking about her work from 2017, how all politics became reproductive politics, from welfare reform to foreclosure to Trump. Uh, it's a 2017 book, but it remains so damn important. It's the one I asked her to speak on tonight. So, Professor Briggs, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for that introduction. It's great to see you. So, as a way of getting us started, you know, in reading this book, from the outside, one can't tell necessarily whether you started out writing about neoliberalism and ended up at reproductive politics or you started out to write a book about reproductive politics and ended up with neoliberalism. But can you walk us through your journey with this book? How did you come to understand all politics as reproductive politics? Well, I started, so I've been writing about US empire and the significance of questions of gender and sexuality to US empire. So questions like um, overpopulation in Puerto Rico and the testing of the birth control pill. And there I I've always been making an argument that sexuality and reproduction are really central to how we should think about politics and how we should think in particular about the politics of Puerto Rico and the United States where there was often no less overt conflict, especially in the early years about um, colonialism. And so I was talking to, um, to my editor at UC Press um, at a conference and we were having dinner and he was saying, well, so what are you gonna write about next? And, you know, I was sort of tossing around some ideas and he said, well, I hope you're not gonna, I mean, obviously you're not gonna to continue to write about reproductive politics, right? And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Reproductive politics is everything. There's nothing you can't write about under the idea of reproductive politics. So, um, and whether we're talking about race in the United States, it's always bound up with questions of reproduction from welfare reform to, um, when we talk about police brutality, we're talking about um, we're talking about the killing of black mothers' sons, um, and so I just started on this riff um, with him about how everything is reproductive politics, and he just sort of sat there for a minute and he was like, "Is that a book?" <laughs> and um, and so I, I was like, well, that doesn't seem very hard. And of course it was much harder than I thought it was sitting over, um, over drinks actually, probably in Puerto Rico. Um, but nevertheless, um, what I wanted to do and, and what I was laying out in that conversation was to channel um, the socialist feminist position from the 1970s or we could say from the 1880s. It's an old, old thought that, um, that the work of reproductive labor, of, of keeping the species going, that we consider private, um, that requires the care of children, the care of elders, birthing, um, the work of putting, keeping a community going, that that's real work and that it creates value. And what we do in sort of classic liberal economics is exclude that from what counts as work, what counts as the economy. And so if we wanna understand how what's happening um, with privatization as a dominant figure in um, the way the economy works. We have to understand where all that work is going when it gets privatized. And it's going to households. And mm -hmm. it's particularly born as unpaid labor on the backs, particularly of female and feminized people, but also of working class and, um, and immigrant people in particular. We learned a lot about that in the pandemic, right? Reproductive labor got a lot more visible mm -hmm. um, 
-hmm. Yeah, great. I know, you know, neoliberalism is a word that's thrown around a lot these days and not always with a great deal of precision. And I'm sure there are people on this call who have their questions about it. So can you give us your working definition of neoliberalism? Um, shout out to Eleanor Byrne here for this question. Um, can you give us your working definition and, and then talk about how the politics of care are so central to that? Sure. So neoliberalism just refers to um, the transformation in the economy that we associate with Reagan. It started a little bit earlier, but we associate with Reagan and the kind of privatization of everything. And it refers to the idea that government shouldn't really do that much. Um, Milton Friedman went so far as to suggest that public schools were socialism. So anytime you hear the word socialism being thrown around in contemporary political debate, it's doing a certain kind of work that of telling us stuff that is illegitimate for, this, for the government to do. Um, so when the Obama administration was promoting um, health care for all, that was um, socialism, right? When um, we have fights over whether there should be um, support for parental leave or um, or checks for um, parents of children, that's, be, that's called socialism. Well, neoliberalism is the name of sh pulling back all those benefits. The other thing that's characteristic of neoliberalism is the idea that while government has no responsibility for those things, neither does private industry. So there was a moment in the 30s, 40s, 50s, when we might have agreed that it was a responsibility of business to pay a living wage or a family wage for, um, for it was a very patriarchal masculinist ideal, right? A living wage to a man who would then support his family. But nobody holds on to that idea, sexist, no, not even a, a sexist version of that anymore, right? If I at Walmart can pay you less than it takes for you to survive, well, good for me. That just means I'm doing a good job as a business person. So neoliberalism is the intensification of, of the fundamental framework of capitalism and shrinking government and shrinking the role of even the private sector in supporting actual human beings. So to the extent that, so dependency becomes a problem for someone else, not the problem of the, of the formal economy. If I, um, if I have children, well, that's my problem. If I have elders who, are, who can't work um, or require um, extensive health care, that's my problem. So, um, so it's the privatization of these concerns about dependency and Privatization basically means I do the work, right? Individuals become responsible for doing the work. And the other thing that we saw in the 1990s was the vast expansion of um, the reliance uh, on immigrant labor in the United States and Europe and elsewhere um, to pick up the slack of the care labor that was being extracted um, by the shrinking of government and the shrinking of the role of private industry. Right. You know, I think I think most people would reflexively understand abortion to be at the center of of modern American conservatism or the, the abortion debate and, and in their case anti-abortion. Um, in substance, in that reproductive freedom disrupts ultra-conservative notions of the well-ordered household. Um, and in tone, in that once you've decided your political opponents are murderers, the nature of politics changes. Um, and when I picked up your book, I thought that that's what it was going to be about. 
is partially about that, but you're after something much broader, as you've just indicated in your, your last answer there. Um, and in your chapter on the anti-feminist streak in US political culture of the last few decades, you're really painting a, a vast portrait of the, the, the depth and breadth of that kind of conservative thinking in our political culture. Can you describe, and you've re begun to do this, but can you describe the many ways that reproduction matters to the modern conservative vision? Um, and for you, this is a story that it, it involves the courts, it involves business, as you said, it, it involves taxation, it involves um, almost everything, but certainly lots of things. Well, and I think we all are on some level familiar with it um, in the sense that all of our political debates are about it. Um, welfare reform, we knew we were in the presence of a different kind of politician um, when Reagan ran for office on, um, with a big story about how he was going to save us from welfare fiends. Um, that was recognizable as a racist story, but it wasn't named in a racist way. In other words, Reagan and um, that era's Republican Party, uh, their particular skill was to sort of fly the flag of white racism without actually um, naming it. You know, and this has become particularly apparent in contrast to Trump, right? Who is very explicit about flying a racist flag, an anti-immigrant flag. Trump, by contrast, sort of comes down that escalator and says, immigrants are rapists. Um, and so Reagan starts telling us about welfare reform. This isn't altogether new. We've been, um, there's been a story on the conservative right that, you know, all people who are getting any government benefits are lazy. But the key thing about the, um, the welfare reform story is it's horror with sex and reproduction, right? Um, so, the so-called welfare mother is having babies just to get a government check. And the other, um, we hear anti-feminism running through this and the, their particular talent is actually to blame feminism for the fact that people are being massively pushed into the workforce by this privatization of um, government, austerity politics, and, um, the, and the end of the family wage. So everybody's got to go to work. Um, women have to go to, uh, in a heterosexual household, mothers have to go to work. Um, young people may have to go to work. And at a certain point, leveraging um, student loans to help pay the bills is part of the story. So as everybody gets pushed into the labor force, there's less and less time to do reproductive labor. And so everybody's feeling this, um, who doesn't have a trust fund, who isn't um, fantastically wealthy. So the traditional middle class is much more stressed. That um, one of the things that people are always like, this is the moment when I got it, is in the book I talk about that moment when you're trying to get to work and you can't get to work because your kid won't put on his shoes and you're losing it. And the stress storm of that is where neoliberalism lives in our lives, right? Um, this, the idea that there's nobody else who's going to be home. Um, the kid has to get to daycare. Um, we have to get to work. Everybody is out of the house. And so how we live that stress, is that a change in the economy, is that right-wing politics, or is it feminism? Well, the brilliance of the right-wing attack is to say, feminists made you do this. Feminists said um, that mothers would be much more satisfied if they could only go to work. Um, the other thing that we're, that happens that we begin to have fights about is the politics of, um, of infertility, for example. 
So one of the things you see all the time in the New York Times and Slate are arguments about um, surrogacy or IVF or um, or what was the one I just saw? Um, miscarriage rates, where people who are um, who are having kids in unconventional ways or who don't have the easy reproductive story just get slammed over and over again in the comment section of the newspaper. Um, they are elitists. They um, they just want to have designer babies. Um, they're way too upset. Of, this is one I just saw. They're way too upset about COVID vaccination rates because they had miscarriages. Well, what's that about? That's about changes in the economy, right? That's about we're all getting pushed to it's harder to get a job without a college degree. So everybody has to get a college degree if they possibly can or go to some kind of um, post high school schooling or training program. Um, and what does that look, what does that do? And then you have to pay off those loans and get a place to live and establish a relationship. What that means is to even barely be in the middle class, you're, um, you're probably 30 before you can think about having children. If you buy into the narrative, as all my students do, that you know you have to be done with school and in a rela permanent relationship in a house with all your loans paid off. Um, so crushing sort of debates over IVF and reproductive technologies. Um, the other thing I talk about is the ways that the subprime mortgage crisis was a reproductive politics question. Um, so single moms were targeted for so-called subprime mortgages. And in fact, lenders were, ref were referring to the subprime as a demographic category. So what did they mean by that? They meant um, single mothers, mostly immigrants or African-American. Um, and so of course, these are people who may find, who have a high need for secure housing um, being pushed into unaffordable mortgages, um, dishonest mortgages that with balloon payments at the end. And so as they begin to become more likely to default on those mortgages in the context of the economic meltdown of 2008, the Tea Party is born out of um, out of an attack on how Obama is going to pay the mortgages of single mothers, of Black and Latinx single mothers. Losers mortgages is the rant um, that leads to, the, um, leads to the founding of the Tea Party. So there's this sort of strong, um, but maybe not always perfectly obvious thread of anti-feminism and concern about racialized reproduction um, that is running through the politics of the right all the way up until sort of Trump comes down that escalator talking about rapists um, who are going to essentially victimize white womanhood and we're going to see um, and we've got to stop them and that's why we've got to elect him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to circle back to a couple of things that you've already touched on. One, one is welfare. Um, you've talked about the kind of negative welfare politics starting with Reagan's welfare queen in the 80s and then there will be assault really on on great society and New Deal assumptions about the state and the state's role in the well-being of the nation. Um, and you might make a parallel argument, and you, you suggested one, about the private sector. I mean, a, a generation or two ago, if you asked any CEO in the country what their obligations were, they would have a long, a pretty long list. I have an obligation to my, my the city that where my factory is. I have an obligation to my workers to pay them a living wage. I have an obli obligation to my consumer. Um, and then somewhere down the list is obligation to the shareholder. And 
by the 1990s, it's basically boiled down to that, the obligation of the shareholder. And that's the, the kind of aggressive and perverse privatization that you're, that you're talking about. I'm going to flip that over a little bit and think about that as a kind of a, a tear in the, in the social contract and thinking about welfare more positively. Um, how do we think about getting back to that, that social contract that existed for around a generation in between, really between the New Deal and the, the first decade or so of the post-war period? Um, that's the exception, actually, in American history, although for some of us of a certain age, it seems like the normal that we're always trying to get back to. I don't think getting back is the right way to think about it getting through to something else is probably the better way to think about it. But how do you think about that social contract that was represented by those kinds of mid 20th century policies and, and how to recoup them? Right, we don't wanna go back there as you're, as you're saying, because it was homophobic, it was sexist, it was, um, it was white in terms of who it was concerned about. Um, but there was like, this moment at the beginning of the Joe Biden presidency, where it seemed like those were the politics that had been brought forward into his administration. We were hearing from um, the Fight for 15 campaign that the goal was to raise the minimum wage. We were hearing from National Domestic Workers Alliance and allied groups of racial justice and labor organizations that we were gonna think in terms of infrastructure as being the care labor infrastructure and the support for care labor infrastructure. Um, and I don't, it's such an interesting political moment, right? In that, I never in my wildest dreams imagined, um, if you had asked me in the 1980s, could someone who calls himself a socialist be the Democratic Party nominee? Like, could that have ha could that happen? Um, and it, it didn't happen. But Bernie Sanders was managed to capture people's imagination in a way that I wouldn't have thought possible. And some of that was carried forward by activists who um, came into the Democratic Party and carried it forward into the Biden administration. That um, it has been um, beaten back under um, by peeling off some member some um, members of the um, of the. Democratic Party, uh, which isn't surprising. Like this is the party of the Dixiecrats, right? This uh, this is the party of white nationalism until um, until the middle of the 1960s. But nevertheless, it was disappointing. Um, so rather than I, and I don't mean to make an argument one way or another about Joe Biden is a good guy or this. I'm not trying to think about electoral politics per se, but merely to sort of name um, some of the currents that are floating around, right? On the other hand, of course, the argument that this is all socialism, as I was referring to before, um, which is an old argument from, um, from Civil War days, right? Socialism is anything that, um, that serves the needs of African Americans um, through the state, whether it's roads or um, or schools. So that's also floating around. The right the right has hung on to power um, or hung on to the ability to make policy, and certainly the courts are clearly going to be a huge part of that. Um, but these have become again tremendously uh, the great society programs have once again become tremendously popular mm -hmm. the um the failure is not because people don't support them so it's hard to say what the future is going to hold mm. Mm -hmm. i want to 
come back to that question um, towards the end. But first, and, and please let me invite your questions to the audience. Um, questions either in the chat or the Q&A, um, and we will field them as we can. Um, the other thing I wanted to circle back to, and you touched on it briefly, but you say so much more about it in the book, is immigration. You have this eye-opening chapter on immigration as, as what you call offshoring reproduction and care. Um, can you explain what you mean by that? And also um, what your analysis portends for our understanding of immigration as a political issue. It's been a kind of spiking fever issue in our politics really since the 1980s. Um, I've never heard it discussed quite the way that you're discussing it though. Can you just give us a, a sense of what that is and, and where it takes us in our thinking? Sure, it's interesting to think about how it's changed since 2017. But what I can, what I was, because, you know, since 2020, virtually nobody has been able to enter the United States. Um, and that's creating uh, an incredible labor crisis that, um, that is, that I keep waiting for, I keep waiting for the moment that that's going to blow up, right? You can't walk down Main Street without seeing 100 help wanted signs. And yet nobody seems to turn around and say, we've got to open up immigration. On the other hand, um, and we're in the present moment, um, seeing uh, also at the level of labor, a real fight between um, that's taking place like in memes on Reddit, as much as it is in labor unions, um, over whether how much can business control labor. Um, I, I will talk about what I what I talked about in the book, but I just have to say I've been absolutely riveted by the question of hospital workers and teachers, right, um, who are who are doing a form of. Um, I'm thinking of nurses and nurses' aides in hospitals. Um, this is feminized labor and it's caring labor and it's dramatically underpaid. And um, it's a group of people that got particularly um, pushed during the pandemic to work without adequate protection, um, to work without appropriate um, mask, masks or whatever it was in, the, in these different contexts. And now, um, as there are shortages, people are starting to notice that they're quitting in droves. And again, there are relatively few, um, few people to replace them. But let me turn, let me turn back to the immigration question because I need that for the rest of my argument about what I'm going to say about the present. Mm -hmm. um, so by the, um, so when Bill Clinton comes into office, we have a big fight about what gets called nanny gate, right? Um, Zoe Baird is his appointee for, um, or is nominee for attorney general. And in the course of her vetting, um, she confesses that um, she did something that was sort of no big deal um, in the context of the 80s, which was to hire um, to hire workers that she sponsored for green cards. Um, so they didn't already have green cards. That wasn't illegal um, in 1987. Um, the Reagan administration kind of shifts the status of those workers. Um, they make some workers able to apply for, um, for to regularize their status, um, to start on a pathway towards citizenship, but people who are not regularized can't work anymore. And so for just a few years in there, these people are in some kind of ambivalent status. Well, that blows up at her confirmation hearing. Um, and she's accused of having hired illegals. And um, the Clinton administration ultimately won't support her. The key thing is 
these were household workers who were doing nanny nanny work and um, one was working as a driver. And we, um, that turned out to be a not unusual immigrant story. The majority of um, immigrants to the United States in the 80s and 90s were women um, who were coming um, as a result of structural adjustment policies, World Bank, IMF, making care labor actually very difficult for them at home, um, raising their own kids, paying school fees, paying for food, paying for health care, structural adjustment policies, which were sort of early neoliberalism, yanked that all out from under people. And so they migrated to work um, it, in higher wage areas so that they could pay school fees, so that they could support kids at home. And the work that they wound up getting um, because they were disproportionately female and what, are, what work do, do women do? They do caring labor, um, was household work. And so nannies, housekeepers, um, that sort of thing. And that was part and parcel of the process that I was describing earlier of the changing nature of the economy, shoving every available worker into the paid workforce, leaving nobody at home mm -hmm. to care for elders, people with disability, young children. Um, and so suddenly that work had to be paid for. Um, but almost, but nobody who was being forced into the labor force could pay very much. And so it shifted it to the most vulnerable workers, um, those least able to negotiate for higher wages or, um, or minimum wage who were um, disproportionately, um, some were African-American, but they were disproportionately immigrants and undocumented immigrants. And so the, um, as, as the formal economy got more and more brutal, the care labor economy had to, had to grow. And so two things were happening simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> in people's home countries, states were withdrawing support for reproductive labor and in, um, places like the United States and Europe, states were withdrawing support for caring labor. And so people were leaving kids at home with grandparents and cousins and so forth and sending remittances home right. while, doing, um, while doing caring labor in the United States or Europe or someplace like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Here's a question that comes off as a challenging one, but I know that you'll be able to take it as a sincere and friendly one. Um, why do you care about the labor crisis when talking about immigration? Banning immigration is an issue not because we need to take advantage of labor, but because the US is on stolen land and we don't have the right to keep people out. Absolutely. <laughs> um, that's absolutely right. You know, there was a, this will seem like an aside, but there was a guy on, um, uh, whose video was circulating on Twitter a lot today who was reporting in six languages from Kiev. And I was thinking, of course, about what it means to grow up in a polyglot kind of place and how that, how being adjacent to many countries with many languages leads you to speak many languages. And I was thinking about the poverty of our linguistic inheritance in the United States by virtue of the fact that um, so many of our neighbors, so many of our neighboring nations have been destroyed or and or their languages have been destroyed. And so um, the so we are we are not a polyglot people in the same way that we used to, that we could have been and indeed that people were in the 16th century. Um, absolutely, immigration, people are, it, it, migration is a human right. 
And we are absolutely sitting on indigenous land. Um, the question of how we think about that in relationship to labor is merely to ask, how, what are the levers that we pull or how do we think about what the consequences for labor have been of unjust immigration policies and native genocides? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's, um, here's another question that I think you'll easily turn into a friendly one. Um, you talk about welfare reforms, et cetera, as this right-wing policy, but Democrats have done racialized and classist damage in the exact same ways, correct? i.e. Gavin Newsom basically destroying welfare in San Francisco, Obama separating families by deporting even more people than Trump. Um, what do you say to your deployment of the use of the word, the phrase right wing, um, when in fact in our two party system, both parties are culpable? Absolutely. I, I mean, I write about that a lot in the book. Um, that neoliberalism is the policy of both Democrats and Republicans. And just because it's right wing doesn't mean Democrats can't do it. Right, unfortunately true. And I, do you see, um, I know most people would say that the Clinton years were the turning point on that. Do you think, would you, would, how would you put that on a timeline? So the Democratic Leadership Council, which is the right wing of the Democratic Party that um, and Bill Clinton is associated with and Al Gore, um, is explicitly the um, is has as its explicit goal to um, make Democrats the party of white men again. Um, literally, their line is you know you can't lose the white male vote and expect to win national elections. Um, so, if Reagan is the turning point for um, neoliberalism becoming absolutely central to the, the Republican Party. Um, Clinton is the figure that makes it central to the Democratic Party. And then Clinton goes even further, right? Because his idea of how to triangulate, that's his word, um, with the um, contract with America Congress Newt Gingrich and the right that comes into power in the midterms um, in his first term um, is to simply adopt Republican um, right. policies as his own. And so, you know, this is where we see a turn to hard, hardline immigration restriction, um, imprisoning excess workers, basically, um, and law and order politics. So yes, Clinton. Okay. Here's another question. Um, Florida resident here. As you know, our Republican dominated Senate uh, state legislature has passed laws allowing parents to sue teachers who discuss sexual orientation and gender identity in schools and also require school personnel to tell parents of changes in a student's emotional health, including if a student tells a counselor about their sexual orientation or gender identity. The Republicans are clearly doing this because they think it will help them with a base of conservative voters. Wondering if you could comment on whether there are historic parallels or if you could put this in historic context. Yes, I want to underscore the, the, the what people are calling the don't say gay laws um, are not law and they're still being contested and debated. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's so if I, one of the things that is, that Trump inaugurates is an ever more sort of vociferous right wing that demonizes people. Part of what I'm talking about in how all politics became reproductive politics is actually a different, it's a different moment. It's a moment when you can refer to people's morality, like people shouldn't have so many babies, people should go to work and they should support their babies. But the um, Trump inaugurates a moment where it's okay again to um, hate people of color, hate immigrants um, as such. Like you can name the whiteness of that, you can 
And I think um, relatively few people recognized how central um, homophobia, transphobia, and sexism were to the Trump project. I think we were um, better at naming the ways that racism was central to his project, but they were utterly intertwined. And um, I'm, in, I'm tempted to say a lot, but I won't go there, um, about how very Latin American this project all is, but that there is um, an inter, interrelated Catholic right that extends from Eastern Europe to Latin America to the United States that has taken trans people, homophobia, and proper gender identity, um, which it says feminism has disrupted to be the central issues that, um, that they're gonna use to mobilize um, public policy. It's not a different strategy, but it's new issues. In other words, their goals are still privatization and um, you know, economic benefit for a handful of well-off people. But the exact form of the issues has changed. So I was interested in how it worked for from about 1980 to about 2020 or 2016, 2017 as um, bad reproduction. Now it's just, you know, those queers, those women, those trans people, those mm -hmm. immigrants, those black folks um, are just bad. We're just gonna um, articulate a right-wing identity politics that is about white men. That's astonishing. I didn't know that would work. Mm. So yeah, I have a question about that. I mean, it's actually kind of a personal one. Um, just your experience of these last years. So you start writing this book before the escalator ride or right around the time of the escalator before. ride? Before. Then, so Trump, Trump actually is the interruption in the argument. I like in the opening months, days of the Trump administration, they're trying to overturn the Affordable Care Act. And I'm like, all Trump has to do is stand up and say, this is health care for um, people who have too many babies, um, Black women who have too many babies. That's all he has to do, and this is dead. And he doesn't do it. He does not have that impulse. Um, so, and so the Affordable Care Act actually survives. So that was when I knew that we were in the presence of something else. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a slightly different flavor that is sometimes not neoliberal. It is um, also associated increasingly with um, an isolationist politics, um, build that wall and um, you know, throw up your hands and say it's perfectly all right if Putin um, invades Ukraine. Yes, right. Well, that's part of that axis, right? I mean, it's not just a Catholic axis, but it's a white supremacist axis that runs absolutely from Australia to the U.S. to Canada to Europe. Right. Or I would say it this way: it's not just Catholic; it's also Christian. Christian. Um, um, Putin is importantly a supporter of the Christian right in Russia and globally. Right. So I had a similar experience. I wrote a book called Barbarian Virtues in 2000, and it was about immigration and foreign policy. And then 9-11 happened. And I, at first I thought, see, I'm right. And then I thought, no, wait, this changes everything. And then I, after a minute, I thought, no, actually, this doesn't change anything. Um, and it, it's that book has been called the best book on 9-11 out there, and which <laughs> I think is not correct, but I understand what the person was saying is that I couldn't have written that book after 9-11. I needed the, the kind of pre-9-11 clarity to see the issues the way I did. But how are you thinking about the pre and post of Trump in relation to this work that you've done? Like, do you think that I mean, do you need to write a new book that takes us up to date or does do your old arguments, are they now bracketed historically in some way or do they do they give us what we need to understand the moment that we find ourselves in? How, how do you think about that? 
Right. It's the Corey Robin, uh, Masha Gessen argument, right? Does Trump change everything or is right. Trump a continuation of everything? Um, and I guess, so, you know, the next, so the, these were the books of me, of my child being little, um, of not being able to, um, not being able to travel to archives. And so I'm back off to the Caribbean if this pandemic ever ends. But so first I wrote How All Politics Became Reproductive Politics, which is a book I could write at my desk. And then I wrote Taking Children, um, A History of American Terror. And Taking Children is clearly the Trump book. Mm. Um, but it's also a historian's book. I, it's like, there's nothing new here. Um, the, um, and we can think about, you know, enslavement and reconstruction. We can think about, um, Indian boarding schools. We can think about all of the efforts to take kids into foster care. We can think about all the, um, slamming of women who use drugs during their, um, Pregnancy, these are all instances that trigger paroxysms of child taking. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible that I've shifted between those two books, between um, the, you know, the finger wagging moral politics of you're not doing a good enough job of taking these kids, teach, uh, raising these kids. Um, and your economic situation is a mess, and therefore we're going to take all your money. Um, to now we're just going to take your kids, and they're obviously not unrelated things, right? Mm -hmm. um, or unrelated impulses. And I think about um, the um, contract with America Congress passing um, TANF, um, which made it much easier to take children um, in, in place of AFDC. And so welfare reform always looked like child taking um, as much as it looked like an opportunity to take benefits. Mm -hmm. So both. Right. <laughs> always the historian's answer, both. Both, whatever right? the question is, both. Um, but what? I mean, that's the problem with being a historian, right? right? Is there's ne it never feels new. No. Even as you go, huh, I didn't see that coming. Well, the, yes. I was going to ask you about that, but I won't. Um, so here's the note I wanted to end on. And I apologize. We got to almost all the questions, but we're, I'm leaving one on the table. Maybe we can circle back to it at the very end. But I wanted to make sure to get to this one. Um, you know, this is an incredibly challenging book that you've written, and not least because it turns out to be so encompassing that it's hard to translate into a politics that has quite enough breadth and fire, if you know what I mean. Um, so I'm just curious, and you went, you mentioned um, socialist feminism or feminist socialism earlier. Um, but what is what is the movement that you think your work is calling for? Because it seems to lap out of the existing categories, even though there are really inspiring, beautiful things happening right now, um, BLM among others. Um, but this book of yours really spills out kind of over all the boundaries. And I'm wondering how you think about what is the politics that this book calls for? Well, in some ways, it's a, it's a BLM book. It's a socialist feminism book. It's a immigrant communities and immigrant movements and labor movements book. What it imagines really is um, the reinvigoration of the kind of left politics that people imagined in the 60s, right? Um, of we're all in this and all of our situations are interconnected and we're we're not going to solve any of these questions without solving all of them together we, there are no individual solutions here and um just as i keep trying to diagnose the way that the right 
pulls on all the threads every time they talk about um, welfare or every time they talk about taking children. Um, I'm imagining a politics from below that can that far that can overturn neoliberalism and state austerity and um, can imagine humane jobs or um, autonomous communities where we support each other. Um, and the, you know, the communities of Jackson, Mississippi and the autonomous movements of the Zapatistas. Um, and these are, these are the kinds of threads that inspire me and speak to me. Um, I, and the thing that's so interesting is all through the Obama years, I was really, really depressed because I felt like I was alone. Like everybody else was perfectly happy with the um, with imperial wars in Afghanistan and immigrant exclusion and the and the destruction of any social safety net, um, as long as it was being done by this charismatic, good-looking guy. Um, and I feel much more hopeful now that there are many, many more people who fundamentally are feeling the same kind of angst about we, you know, we can't keep being this same kind of cruel place that um, allows people to go hungry and allows people's stuff to get taken and people to get thrown out of their apartments and into the streets. We can't allow ourselves to keep being this cruel place. That should be our flag right there. <laughs> Laura Briggs, thank you so much. I really appreciate your coming and joining us and, and spending the time with us and sharing your, your wisdom and your insight. Um, I wanna remind everyone uh, Friday, March 4th at noontime, we'll have a special session uh, with my colleague, Laura Barakloff. We'll be talking about the National Park Service heritage sites and heritage trails as democratic or non-democratic cultural forms. Um, I hope you can make it to that and um, take care of yourselves. Uh, the pandemic is not over. Keep your guard up. Don't let the guard down. Be smart, get vaxxed, get boosted, wear a mask, stay home when you can. I don't know, I, I feel very protective of, of our, my neighbors. Um, take good care, everybody. Good night. And, and Laura, thank you so much. It's really, it's really been great talking with you. Thanks, Matt.